All right, take your Bibles, if you would, please, tonight, and open to the book of Colossians, chapter number one. Colossians, chapter number one. As Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, he is reminding them of certain things that they need to incorporate, of course, in their lives. They're going to help when it comes time that, uh, oh, whatever problems, difficulties, because life is going to be full of them. The good thing about it is the Lord has provided the security, the help, and the understanding to help you and I when those unique times come. Sometimes it, uh, it, they're brought about in a number of different ways, but all of those are to give us a little bit of insight because God doesn't let anything come your way that he's not wanting to teach a lesson. Now, I'll put it like this. Sometimes things come your way just to in, incorporate what you already know. The problem is, is when we recognize the external influence that comes our way, we can recognize it as being something external, and we know that that may be the enemy using that, and so that can become an obstacle. We can easily verify it, see it, and keep it at bay. The more difficult ones are those that are very close to us. In other words, they're our own difficulties and the, our own problems that we face in some manner or another. The most difficult is the ones where it is the person that you care for that's causing some grief for you. In other words, when it's, uh, for instance, Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them he knew and even told is going to betray me. Now you understand that in Mark chapter number three, he said, I've chosen 12 that they should be with me. And these men walked with him daily. They were with him during the exciting times and the not so exciting times. Because you understand that Jesus traveled a lot of places and uh, most of the time their traveling was usually on foot. Now there could be the, the instance where they uh, joined in on a caravan and there could possibly be. The Lord doesn't tell us a great deal how he transported from place to place. It could have been uh, maybe in a cart at some point. It could have been on animals at some point. But the truth is most of the time you see them walking. He walked on the water. He had just a, that number of things. They did a lot of walking. Now understand something. They did not have the, the nice Air Jordan support shoes that we have today. And so they had to uh, use whatever method they have. So sometimes their walking incorporated an entire day of just walking. The truth is, I'm sure that they probably, depending upon the, uh, the season a little bit, they probably walked a little bit closer to the evening time when it was cooler and not in the blazing sun of that day. They would, I'm sure, usually try to stop during the very hot, hot parts of the day. So they, uh, when you travel, you're not completely quiet all the time. There's usually conversations that go on. Most of the time when people are together, they begin to converse, talk about things and talk about ideas and talk about what they plan for the future and talk about uh, matters of interest along those lines. <laughs> Keep in mind, they didn't have television, they couldn't talk about sports. They didn't have the, the internet so they couldn't be sharing the, the latest uh, Facebook reels. <laughs> they couldn't do that. They couldn't share some of those things there. It had to be literally what they were dealing with right then, right there, or maybe what they had just experienced or the words that the master had spoken. And I imagine Judas on many of these times because for three and a half years, he traveled with the Lord Jesus every single day. So I'll let you add that up. Every year has 365 days. So if you multiplied 365, by three, and then added a half of that, so you'd have to divide 365. See, this is not common core math. This is the old style stuff. That, but uh, in that manner, so he was with him for a very, very long time. He watched him during the Sabbath. He watched him on the work days. He watched him at different times. He watched him in all of these events. But yet, out of all of those things, out of all the words that he spoke, and out of all those things, he was still willing to betray him because of money. And we look at how cheap that really was when it all boils down. 
But you understand that sometimes Satan does not care how your difficulties come. He is going to bring them your direction in some manner or another. And they may come from something that you did not expect. The problem is, is when they come from you, you recognize them and you, you, you say, man, I'm just, a, I'm just a wretch. But when it comes from some place that you really didn't almost expect, sometimes it's a little more difficult. So as the Lord Jesus now is teaching in Colossians, he is giving a little insight into some of these areas of life uh, that you may need some solid ground when it seems things shake up just a little bit. Could you imagine as the others, Peter, James, and John, as they found out, because they all sat there at supper with him and asked, Lord, is it me? Is it me? I think probably a number of them said, nope, it's going to be Peter. He's been a mess all the time. I mean, he's hot and cold. He's up and down all the time. So it's going to be Peter. That's who it is. But it wasn't. Because the person that they trusted the most was the one that, for the most part, held the bag, held their monies, held their finances. And it was Judas. So in that manner, sometimes things will occur out of places that you and I would not expect. So as the Lord's beginning to deal with uh, a little bit of those areas of life, he says there's two things that you need to understand about this. Since difficulties are going to come from your own experience, from the exterior, and then from those that uh, are places that you would not expect, he said there's two things that you need to have. You need to have convictions and principles. Convictions and principles. See, a conviction is what you will die by. I'm going to die by the convictions that I have. I'm not going to change them. Now, we all know that sometimes they get tried. They oftentimes get pressured. They oftentimes, others around us, and uh, whatever the case may be, things begin to change. And it's like, look, this is a conviction that I have. I'm not changing it. I'm going to live with this until the day I die. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes we, we may learn a little bit later on that it's not that, uh, maybe we were a little too stringent. Who knows? But, and I've already put it like this. If I'm wrong, if... When I get to heaven, the Lord says, you didn't have to do that. I'll just apologize for the rest of eternity. But, uh, but he's going to say, well, it kept you from making a mess of yourself, so to speak. But those principles are what we will live by. So the conviction is stated, I'll die by this because I'm not changing. Let, look, one conviction is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ forgives sins. It just does. And because of that, I'll die by that. I, I, I will die by the fact that anybody can trust Christ as Savior, and it will never, it is not a temporary thing. It is an eternal thing. Jesus made it very clear. He never, when he was talking about salvation, talked about a temporal type thing. It was never just, uh, and now there's plenty of things. In other words, he would use the expression, it came to pass, it came to pass. Salvation is not one of those things that came to pass. It is one of those things that he makes sure that he always uses those words, eternal, forever, everlasting. And uh, probably one of the most famous verses that, that we memorize from, from as early on in our lives is John three sixteen. All right. D how many think you could probably quote that right now if you had to? All right. D Brother Caleb, you want to give it a shot? All right. Let's hear it. Have everlasting life. From just a very small child, you learned that salvation was for everlasting and so in that manner, God gives us those things. Now, there's some things in, in life that I'm, I'm just not going to change. I'm just not. And uh, now, there's plenty of things that are my preferences that I can learn to change, adjust, and things. But there's some things I'm just not. And, uh, and you ought to have some of those stances too. I'm just not going to do it. And, uh, and so it's something that says, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm just not going to. Uh, that means that if they, for instance, the three Hebrew children, they came and, and they had been taught and they had been given principles and they'd been given directives. You don't bow down to any other graven image. You just don't do it. Uh, scripture had made it very clear. And the Ten Commandments that had come down uh, as far as thou shalt have no other God before me. And so the second that uh, Nebuchadnezzar built that great, great big statue and said when the music plays, everybody bows down. They said, we're not bowing. We're just not. Well, we'll kill you. It doesn't matter. We're not bowing down. Now, these are young men. They had their whole life ahead of them, but they had already determined there's a conviction in my life. I'm not bowing down. And I, I like the, the statement as it says. It says, you know, he's, as they're talking to Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, he was, known for, he was known for cutting you up and destroying your home and turning it into a dunghill. He, he, made that, he makes that 
expression many times in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar meant what he said. He did. And when he told them, we will heat the furnace up hotter than it's ever been and we will throw you in there, they knew he wasn't lying. He'd do it. So when, he, when they said, be it known, O king, that we will not bow down and our God is able to deliver us. But if not, we're still not bowing down. If he delivers us, great. If he doesn't deliver us, great too. Because if he delivers us, we'll live tomorrow. If he doesn't deliver us, we'll live in heaven. But in that manner, it's one of those things that they just had that conviction, willing to die by that. And they were not going to bow down. Now, he tried to negotiate with them. Look, I like you guys. You're, you're good guys. And uh, if you just, the next time it plays, I'll give you a pass this time. I know everybody saw you and it came up to me that you hadn't bowed down. Maybe you didn't understand or whatever the case. Now I'm talking to you. I'm the head honcho. You understand? I mean, the big man on campus is telling you this. So they, they can see us talking right now. And they said, no, we're just not doing it. It made him, the Bible says that he was enraged. He bound them up. He took some of the mighty men out of his, uh, out of his armament. And out of his uh, armies, the truth is those that threw them in, the fire was so hot, it killed them. So he lost good men in the process. So in that, they ended up getting thrown in the fiery furnace. But pretty soon, the, somebody said, uh, excuse me a minute. Didn't we throw three in there? How come I see four? And he looked down and he said, yes, I see four. And it looks like one is the son of God. That's a conviction. That's something you're going to die by. I'm just not changing. But those principles are how you and I are going to live our daily lives according to those convictions. So uh, in, in this instance, he is reminding us here of some of those things, and he wants to give us. Look, if you would, please, in uh, chapter number 1, Colossians chapter number 1. Look, if you would, please, beginning in verse number 17. The Bible says this, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have ye, uh, yet now hath he reconciled. He goes on in verse number 22. In the body or his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which have preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So he is reminding them why we have these convictions. He is reminding them why we should principle our life. And I want to mention, if I could, just three that are stated in these verses right here. He said one of the very first things that needs to be something that you're going to do, a principle of life, is this. In verse number 23 it says, If ye, and here's the first one, continue. Continue. That means that your principle of life ought to be determined by this. I'm just going to continue even when difficult times come. I'm just going to do right no matter what's in front of me. I'm just going to continue to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to continue to do those things. Now, you would think that that would be very easy, but sometimes to continue means I can't move as quickly as I have been moving. That means that I may have to slow down. It means that there's a barricade in front of me. It means that during this season and during this time of the year, there is one thing that, that we have a great deal of, especially around the Chicagoland area and always on Interstate 80 is construction. Always. I, I have been driving that same route now for almost 20 years and there is always, every single, not just this time of the season, I mean every, all year long, there is some type of construction going on on that road. Always. I am not a fan of that road. I don't like it. I, I have told the Lord, I hate this road. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it is, always has something going on on it, always. And, uh, and so during that construction, but that means that there's going to be an element, but it's going to get me where I need to go. So there's times that I have to slow down. I can't go as fast as I would like. I can't go as fast as the, the vehicle that I'm in is, is able to go. I'm not even able to go as much as if everything was right that I could go as fast, but I have to continue. Sometimes I have to slow down. 
God is reminding you that in your daily life and in the life that you're to live, there is something that you need to do. Even when something comes that changes everything, even though it seems like I've got momentum, just, just let me go, God. And God says, no, it's time for you to slow down. Why? I've got something I want you to learn in your life. So in that process, sometimes you have to slow down or there's going to be a mess. I think it's always funny. And I think, uh, I think Miss Becky kind of introduced uh, or mentioned the actual term uh, that, uh, that, it, that they tell you to do these days. I'm not a big fan of it. I'm not. But there used to be the time where folks would get in the one lane and everybody would go through, you know, relatively quickly. But they would get behind each other a ways back. Oh, no, not now. You run right up to the edge of the barricade and you get your nose of the car in there and eat your way in. You say, oh. Some of us older drivers is like, I hate it when they do that. Man, that bothers me. But that they're teaching that to people today and it's called zippering. It's called foolishness. Don't do it. That's what it's called. But if you want to try to zip her in and I don't feel like letting you in, don't get all upset. Zip her back there. <laughs> you see, do you do that? I'm not going to admit. I can neither, I can neither, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? I can neither affirm or deny that. And so, but, uh, but no, I, I, I'll try to let folks in as they come up. Now, if, uh, if we're already up to the end and somebody runs all the way up to the very end still trying to squeeze in, I am really not a fan of that. I'm really not. I actually have, now, I would have let the fella in. And uh, matter of fact, I had, I had almost come to a stop because I saw him flying up in my mirror. And uh, this happened uh, not, oh, it's been quite some time ago. And, uh, and so I saw lights, you know, coming up very fast on this side. And it's like, I'm almost to the barrels right now. And it's like, he's not trying to get in. He's coming all the way up here. So I come to a complete stop. He tried to squeeze in between me and the barrels, hit the barrels, and then stopped in the road and, and got out and looked at me and said, you hit me. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and I called him an idiot. I did. I said, you're an idiot. And, uh, and so, and he, because he stopped the entire road now. And we pulled over there and, uh, and we pulled over because he accused me of hitting him and called the cops. And the police came there. And, uh, and I think it was funny because he said, he said, you call him an idiot. I said, he is an idiot. I said, I was literally stopped. I didn't hit him. I said, I was stopped, guaranteed. I said, I saw him coming up here. And uh, he said, well, the damage is on the front corner of his vehicle. He said, that would not be where you were at. It's like it would have been on the back part of, of where you were. I said, yeah. I said, he ran up there, tried to squeeze in between me and the barrels, and there just wasn't enough room. I had already come to a stop. Because I saw him, and uh, he said, yeah, he is an idiot. <laughs> and so I said, oh, well, you know, he doesn't like somebody calling him that, but that's exactly what it was. Look, sometimes God needs you and I to slow down just a little bit because he's got something for us to, to learn. And, uh, but he wants us to not stop. He wants us to continue. So in other words, that means continue to take the next step. Just because those barricades are up there doesn't mean stop. Just because it seems like something's in front of you doesn't mean stop. It may mean, one, you may have to slow down. Two, it may mean you must put forth more effort. For instance, when uh, you, you watch oftentimes the, uh, uh, the football practices and they'll put, that, they'll, they'll put that slide up there and usually the, 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 the fattest coach gets on that thing. And uh, then the, the fellas, you know, duck their shoulder and hit that thing and try to push and, uh, and push that as hard as they can. What he was teaching them is this. Don't stop. Don't give up. Keep pushing. Because sometimes it may mean you need to slow down. And it may mean that you may have to just push a little bit harder. You may not be able to go as fast. And you may, it may not be able to go as quickly as you'd like. But it may mean you may have to put forth more force at this time. It may mean you have to rely upon the strength that God has provided for you. And not just move quickly and, and fly past things. He may say, and, and understand this, when God allows some resistance to come in your life, what he's doing is he's building your faith. He's building your strength. He's building your ability to keep pushing on, even when the difficult times come. Because the truth is, the difference is this. You take a fellow that needs to work on his uh, ability, not agility, but his ability, and in that manner, he hits that and has to push hard. 
and he hits it and pushes hard, and he hits that and pushes hard, pretty soon the muscles are going to begin to grow. Pretty soon the, the effort and the force that once slowed him down, now it's not slowing him down so much. Satan knows that sometimes he's going to put something in your way. But if God's already given you the strength and the fortitude to do what's necessary, this time when he puts up a barricade, Satan says, I'll slow him down. I'll put a barrier in front of him, and you hit it hard. And all of a sudden, he's, and you, he thinks, whoa, his faith is increased. And you keep pushing. And it's like, I understand this barrier is here, but it's not going to stop me. I'm going to do what scripture says. I'm going to continue. That means when somebody comes and says, you don't need to be doing what you're doing, you can keep pushing on. It, when somebody says, why are you doing what you're doing? Or however the case may be, or, or whatever it comes, oftentimes from family, they will turn and say, you're being a fanatic about things. It means that you're going to have to increase your faith and just push a little harder. Because it's one of those, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to continue in the Lord's sake. Because the verses right before this are a reminder that we're doing it for the Lord's sake. We're doing it because of him. We're doing it for the Savior. So in that manner, sometimes it means you may have to slow down. But sometimes that continuing may mean that you need to just continue to press harder, that you may have to ex exert a little more force, but continue, continue. The very next thing that he says here is this, if you continue in the faith, but I want you to notice that next word, grounded, grounded. The interesting thing about this is all over this building right now, we have grounding rods for uh, the thing to keep things safe. That grounding is this, when everything begins to come a little bit unwired, that there's a grounding that takes place to keep you safe. It literally is saying there's an anchor that will hold you when the difficult times come. So that means rely upon that anchor that is there. The other day, uh, Brother John and I, he asked me if I'd go fishing with him. And I don't go fishing a great deal, I don't. I, I, I like to go and it's fun, but, uh, but I'm a very impatient fisherman, I am. If things aren't beginning to hit the, the lures or, or hit the bait and things that pretty quick, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to go. It's like, now nope, there's food to eat somewhere <laughs> or, or something along those lines. But I, I want to spend time with, uh, with Brother John. He, uh, we hadn't had a chance to spend much time at all. And he asked me if I'd go fishing with him. So I said, sure, I'll go. So he had uh, gotten things ready and uh, we got in his boat. We went over to one of the lakes that's here. And, uh, and so we began to fish. And as we were there, the wind began to pick up. And, uh, and, and, and instead of the boat just sitting right there, it was moving quickly. <laughs> you know, you'd cast over here and then you'd be a half mile this way while you're, it's like, I don't have to reel things in, I'll just drag it and let it go. But, uh, and so we were trying to find a spot and, uh, and fish, but the wind kept pushing us away from it. And I asked him, I said, do you have an anchor? He said, no. And so what he was trying to do is he's trying to hold the trolling motor to hold us in, pay, in place. But the wind was so strong, it was still pushing us. And, uh, and so in that manner, uh, he said, so we tried to find another place. Maybe the wind hadn't, uh, wasn't hitting the lake so hard and we couldn't do it. But, uh, and so I asked him, I said, Doc, I said, we're going to have to get an anchor. And he said, well, I don't have one. I said, well, you got your little dog. I said, uh, how long can he swim? And, uh, but, uh, but Jesse was with us at the time. And so, uh, but uh, in, that, in that instance, of course, we were just joking and teasing, but he, he didn't have anything to keep us in place. And so no matter where the wind was blowing, we got pushed. When God says grounding, that means that you find that security of who Christ is, what he has said, and you don't move. In that manner, he said, continue, but you've got to make sure that you're grounded. You know why you're continuing. You know what you're continuing about. And you don't allow those things to be, uh, uh, if you want to call it like this, changed by and pushed about with every wind of doctrine, as Scripture says. There's going to be a lot of things that sound good. There really is. The truth is, in the end times, Scripture says that there's going to be many people, and, and they're going to lead people away. But Scripture says this, if you are grounded... If you take scripture and you say, I'm just not changing on this, that's part of what that principle of life is. I'm going to live by this. I'm just going to determine that uh, we, we sang a song a little earlier, uh, how precious it is to hold a newborn baby. But the security is this, knowing that he will be able to uh, stand against uncertain days because Christ lives. Now, because of that, that's one of those things that say, look, I'm just grounded in the fact that Jesus knows who I am, where I'm at, what I'm going through, and he is going to see me through. 
He is. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed in him against that day. That is the anchor that is there. So when everything comes along and folks begin to say, well, things are changing, things, it's like, no, it doesn't have to. I'm grounded. Uh, and by the way, that means that sometimes that conviction is going to have to be this. When things around you, and I'm not talking about necessarily family. I'm not talking about circumstances. I'm talking about when uh, your government and mine begins to say that your worshiping is going to be wrong. Man, that is one of the things that, that bothered me so desperately when they had the COVID scare. Because they begin to lock down churches and, uh, and begin to keep people from assembling. Now, they could go to their protest rallies. They could go to their BLM meetings and protests. And they could go to their riots. But they couldn't go to the house of God. grounded. Let me put it like this. They were just wrong. Because one, uh, I know they said, well, it, it's for public safety. I, under, I understand what the attempt was, but anytime you allow somebody to let that public safety begin to get involved with, uh, with the truth of scripture and what you choose to do, let me put it like this. You're a grown up. You can choose what you're going to do. You don't need the government telling you what to do. If you determine this would not be a safe place for me to, to be or this would not be safe for me, I'm going to, I, I can't do that. Then that's your decision. That is not them to say, we'll just shut it down so you can't go. Now, that's just wrong. That's why when, uh, now, they didn't want people to meet closely, and we did not. So we went out to the parking lot, and we set up the trailer out there. I got the FM transmitter. You could turn in your, tune in your radio to that FM station. I preached to all of us out in the car. If we wanted baptism, people would turn on their windshield wipers and spray. And so, uh, you know, and, but, uh, uh, but in that instance, I mean, you could hear what was going on. You could see what was going on. We still did exactly what scripture says, assembled. And that's what we did. Uh, the very first week, I think we started over here and then we determined we'd come over here. Mrs. Whitworth stayed out here by the, the driveway and handed out snacks for folks to have. And uh, there'd be people that'd be driving by. Sometimes they'd drive by, they'd pull in. And see, what's going on? Say, we're having church outside. So they'd come in. She'd tell them and I hand them a bulletin. I think it would have the, the actual FM station in it. You could turn to it and, and listen in. And, uh, and so, uh, but we were able to assemble. Then a few, a few weeks later, we were able to, of course, come back into the building. We, we moved things around to separate, to try to appease uh, folks along those lines. I don't want anybody to be unsafe. I don't. But there's still a grounding that says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And God, even as you see the day approaching, and, uh, and in that manner, it's just going to be. I, I wonder someday that if you and I disagree somewhat with our government and the principles that they establish. You understand that me preaching from this Bible is teetering even right now on what they want to consider as hate speech. It really does. And the second that they pass a law that says if you uh, proclaim any hate speech whatsoever, you will not be able, we will shut you down, we'll lock the doors. Well, I've already bought bolt cutters, so I'm not worried about it. You say, what if they arrest you? I, then I'll go to jail and preach. But uh, I, 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 I certainly would hate to have to go through all of that. That's why at five o'clock when I pray, Lord, allow my country to stay free. Allow the freedom that has always been. Don't allow the, a, a wicked government to change who you are and how you do things in our world, please. Grounded, grounded. And then lastly, of course, the, the one that is sometimes the, the one that's most enjoyable is this. The very next word is, uh, as you said, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. That word settled is this. It's rest in the decision that's made. You are resting in the decision that's been made. I'm not changing it. <laughs> I'm secure in it. I'm just happy about it. You say, what if everybody else causes you difficulty? It doesn't matter. The verse that uh, we uh, looked at before, one of my favorite ones from, uh, uh, that's in Scripture. Now I have a number of those that are here, and my, my life verse is in Isaiah. But in that manner, I enjoy this. So I'd like for you to take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn over to the book of Job. Job chapter number 13. Job chapter number 13. Right before the book of Psalms is the book of Job. Job chapter number 13. I've pointed it out many times. You've seen it. But this is where Job has just determined I'm going to be settled. It is literally saying this. And the first part of the verse reminds you of this. Verse number 15. Chapter number 13, verse number 15. The Bible says this. Though he slay me, and of course he's talking about God. Though he slay me, yet 
will I trust in him? He says, I'm just settled. I'm just settled. And because of that, even in the New Testament, as Paul is writing, he says, uh, I mentioned the verse earlier, I am persuaded that he is able. And God is making it very clear, uh, very clear that when you are settled, that those things, when something comes up, it just doesn't bother you a great deal. It may cause a little bit of difficulty. It may cause, it's like, look, I'm, I'm just settled. I'm not changing. I'm just not going to do it. If things begin to, to turn, it's like, look, I'm just settled. I'm not going to do that. And uh, there's been occasions where <laughs> the, it, it may come from different circumstances. It may be from the boss. It says, look, you, you have to work at this time. And I said, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I just, uh, I, I can't do that. You'll have to do whatever is necessary. Well, we'll write you up. <laughs> I told him before, I said, look, it takes two hands to pull my file out. Now, one more piece of paper ain't going to make that big of a difference. He said, well, what if, what if you get in trouble? That's all right. I still serve a God that can take care of things. I'm not terribly worried about it. I don't want it. I'm not looking for it. But if I have to stand on what I believe is right and what they say is, is going to happen, then I'll just stand on what's right. I just will. Like I said, I don't look for it. And I don't try it. I don't press them. I try to do everything possibly I can to negotiate in that manner and say, look, I'll, I'll come in at a different time. There's occasions where uh, they, uh, they make mandatory weekends. Now, I get in already uh, on Saturday morning, so I can't take off. I did one time. I determined, okay, as soon as I have my 10 hours off, I will, uh, I'll drive back out. Now, hopefully, I can get everything said and done and be back here by Sunday morning at church and everything else. I'll be a little tired, but, uh, but I did that one time. And I was in Indianapolis. I wasn't that far away, but I had a flat tire. And all of a sudden, it was taking them a while to get out there and get it changed. Now, sometimes it takes up to four hours. That is never fun. But he was out there relatively quick and got the tire changed. But it still pushed me to a point where I was able to get home, get cleaned up, and get here by 9.30. Well, guess what starts at 9.30? Sunday school. I was worn out, and I determined I'm not going to do it again. He said, well, do they still have you work on the weekends? Yes. There's, and I try to find somebody that will uh, work for me because they, they want to do that. But if not, then I tell them, look, You'll get me after, after church service on Sunday night. That's when you'll get me. Well, will you have your 10 hours off? I said, according to you, I will. But I'm just not going to make the, the people of our church suffer because you determined that you've got to move popsicle sticks from point A to point B. I said, I'll, I'll stay up the rest of the night. And uh, I said, but, uh, but you're not getting me at my best anymore. You're just not. And I'm not taking a chance of getting there at the last minute to take care of uh, church people. I'm just not. And so that's the way it has to work. I'm settled. It's just one of those things that you'll get me when I'm available for the most part. I'm settled about it. God makes it very clear. And uh, one last verse. We'll look at this and then we'll be done tonight. Take your Bible if you would, please. Verse that I've already made mention. Turn to 2 Timothy, if you would. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. If you're there in the book of Colossians, just a few more pages over. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. As Paul is writing here, notice if you would please chapter number 1, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. He said very clearly, there's some things I'm, I'm going to have to face that will bring me some discomfort. There will be some literal suffering that comes. But I like that next word, nevertheless. He says, suffering will come, but nevertheless. Difficulties may face, but nevertheless. I'm settled. He goes on to say, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He said, I'm settled. He's my anchor. He is my grounding rod. He is the, the one that I'm going to follow. So that conviction, what I'm going to die for, but the principles are this. What will I do? I will continue. I will be grounded. And I'll be settled with the fact of what I have chosen to do, God will bless. I'll be settled. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you again for the opportunity to open your word. I do ask that you'd please just help us now as we look at just a few things in scripture that could be a help and encouragement and motivation in our daily lives. I just ask that you'd please. 
when everything begins to falter and change around us, I ask that you'd please help us to continue to stay grounded and be settled in what you have already stated. Lord, I do ask that you'd please just work tonight to accomplish your will. Thank you again for your kindness, and I ask, Lord, for your help. Now, with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, the question tonight is this. Maybe it's time to just look at where we stand with our convictions, what we're going to live by. Are we going to continue even though we may need to slow down? Are we can, going to continue even though we may have to put forth a little more effort? And then are we going to stay grounded and find that security, that anchor when things begin to push on us just a little bit? Sometimes the forces are going to be greater than what we are, but we can find security in that grounding that the Savior provides in his anchor. And then are we just going to be settled? I'm just pleased with what God is doing. I may not be able to change it, but I can live in it and find security in what he is doing with me and through me. That's settled. Maybe that's your prayer tonight. In just a second, we're going to stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. The instruments will play. The altar will be open. You may be able to come and do business with your Lord tonight. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed. As the instrument begins to play, if God's spoken to your heart tonight, the altar is open. You may come. Continuing lasts for a very, very long time. Dr. Evans used to say Christianity is not measured in years, it's measured in decades. For some of you, your entire life has been filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the very first words that you ever heard was, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible told me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. All the way from day one, the gospel has been surrounding you. What a blessing it is. And you have been able to find that security. Maybe that wasn't your beginning. Maybe somebody had to give you the gospel and you accepted it. But it's just as real today as it's ever been. The positive things about it is God never weakens. Never does. He is just as strong as he has ever been. He is willing to work through you and I. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Thank you again for your kindness. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now as we are going to begin a new week, Lord, that you'd please help, guide, give direction, help us, Lord, to continue to be grounded and settled. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help us now to do what we should for thy sake. Help us to be the people that we should be and help us to carry your name as we should. I do ask that you'd please just bless. Thank you again for our church in Jesus' name. Amen.